Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're logging in. You're very welcome to this space. Um, we just want to firstly just thank you for making the time and you know showing interest um, in having this conversation. And we consider this space to be our space, a space for us to 
explore how things can be done differently to reimagine our world and the systems and structures that have become the norm and you know the global order if you like or the renowned order for doing things we believe that we can think about these things differently and so we invite you to share your views um you know using chats or when we get to the question and answer space we have an incredible panel panel of for you um but before we get to that we thought we can start off with thinking about um why are we even doing this so this space has been collectively organized by akina mama or africa fair share and we are feminist leaders and we're collaborating to create um, a learning space we started off with the first series, which was held earlier in September, where we're looking at hierarchy versus feminism. You know, can we have feminine, how do you do feminist leadership in an organization structure? Should we have organization structure? How do you marry the two? Are they workable? Thinking about hierarchies and how we can reimagine that in the in the in the in the in, in the space of organizing and organizations. This second space then is looking at the elephant in the room, the issue of salary and performance management. Um, and the third session will be looking at collective care and personal care. And all of these three series were um, inspired by feedback that we got from a survey. We ran a survey earlier this year to find out uh, what, what feminist leaders and feminists and people that are interested in you know, feminist leadership, what they were grappling with, what they wanted to have a conversation around. Uh, we got an incredible amount of feedback and a lot of it was around you know, feminist leadership and organization hierarchies. How do I do that differently? Performance management and salaries, what is a feminist approach to that? And then thinking about collective care, well-being, individual and organizational well-being. And so today we do have an incredible panel, as I mentioned, and I will not introduce them now, um, but rather I would want us to just take some time to um, input towards a Mentimeter that we have for you, where we just want to think about, you know, what is wrong with our, with our performance management approaches currently? Are they, are they working for us? Are they not working? Um, and if we were to have feminist approaches to performance management and compensation package or, or remuneration, what would that look like? So let me invite my colleague to you know, share the Mentimeter link. Has it been shared yet? Um, so that we can input towards it. Um, the point on captions is well noted. My colleagues will make sure that we have, um, we do have the, we have captions. And I've also taken note of the ask for the takeaway or recording from the first um, from the first series. We'll gladly share that with you. That's well noted. Right. While we're waiting for the Mentimeter, um, feel free to continue introducing yourselves um, if you're just logging in. The Mentimeter is in the chat now. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon.
Right, there's about 87 participants on the call, so we should have many more results than that. It would be good to hear what you think. Do you think our current approaches to performance management and remuneration work? One person says yes. Um, 30 say no, 17 are not sure. Keep it coming. So we have about 60 results now. Um, we'll just give it a bit more time, maybe a minute more to hear from any other. And if you're struggling with Mentimeter, please let us know. Feel free to type in your answer um, in the chat. As I mentioned, this is our space and the idea is to reflect together and reimagine our world together. Right, I think we can move to the second question. So essentially we have a majority believe that the current approaches do not work. While um, the second majority are not sure. And I think that's important because the idea is not to throw away the baby with the water, right? Or the water with the baby rather. But to think about what about the current approaches make them problematic or challenging when one thinks about feminist um you know, uh, when one thinks about inclusivity, when one thinks about fairness, when one thinks about issues of power dynamics and unequal power relations, and then say, what can we draw from the current models, for example, that can be applied, um, can, that can be um, applied and workable, and what about them makes them problematic and we want to really um, do away with, with, with that. Okay. So we'll have a second question. Sharon, are we ready for the second? All right. Okay. I think we can always come back to our Mentimeter later on. The idea, again, as I said, it's, you know, have, um, well, it's a conversation space. So we will be able to come back to you and hear from you. So turning to our panelists now, I it's you know it's my honor and my pleasure to introduce all of them. These are incredible women and feminists, um, some of whom I have been following for a number of years, um, and others whom we have learned about along the way. And I think they have something to offer in terms of rethinking performance management and salaries, or nuancing our thinking around performance management and salaries remuneration compensation package. I think it's important to think about beyond salaries, to think about the compensation package in its totality and what that can look like and what that should look like if we are thinking about practicing feminist leadership. So in no particular order, we have Enich Pembere. She is a feminist personal development and coach. Um, she has um, a high, high number of years of experience um, in the social justice space and women's rights space. And I like something she said in, when we when we met to prepare for this space. She said, "You know, we are we are the people we are the feminists that work from the background." I think often we forget um, colleagues that work in support services. So think about human resource management, finance, um, even events management. There's a lot of work that goes into ensuring that um, you know feminist organizing happens. And a lot of times we think about frontline leaders, if you like, or the frontline persons, the activists, the advocates that are speaking in spaces or, I don't know, issuing statements and forget these other feminists that work from the background, quote unquote. So I like that she pointed that out. She, she runs a career development and wellness program. You can find her posts on Twitter, on LinkedIn. Um, and um, she does have her own outfit as well, where she's providing personal um, coaching. And she does this from a self-leadership perspective. Our second panelist is Jackie Asimwe. 
She's a feminist to reckon with. Um, she's a qualified lawyer by profession and a human rights activist. She thrives on empowering leaders um, and is fully committed to going above and beyond to ignite the drive in the upcoming generation. Essentially, she's very much invested in building leadership and building leaders. And her experience spans over the civil society, um, government, donor agencies. I think it'll be interesting to hear from her then, from her, her experience on performance management and remuneration from this wide, um, wide array of experiences. She's a founder and chief executive officer of Civ Source Africa. It's located in Uganda. And so there she has introduced an innovative form of rotational leadership where she confidently oversees and steers the process of allowing others to step into her shoes as the CEO of CV Source Africa. So they have a rotational um, CEO arrangement where any other person, I think she'll share more, can uh, place the role of the CEO of the organization. I think there, there's something to be, to be interrogated about how do you do performance management in that kind of arrangement? And what does the compensation look, um, compensation look like? Do you assume the compensation package of the CEO um, or not? And finally, but not least, we have uh, Maxencia on the call as well. Maxencia is an incredible, incredible woman that has surmounted and overcome so many, so many challenges. Um, she is a person living with a disability. Um, she is also positively li living positively with HIV. And it was from her personal experiences and the effects of HIV that led her to start Lubuja Community Health Caring Organization, where she provides community support and primary health care services to vulnerable women and girls. But besides that, she's, actually, she's a political leader. She's a feminist leader. She's, um, she's many things. Um, and um, it's, quite, it's quite an honor to have her here so that we can also hear from her about performance management, about how um, from a personal experience, what that means for her, but then also what she has seen in the different spaces that she, that she engages and has engaged. I think something about the political space, thinking about what awards look like or remuneration looks like in, a, in, the, in that kind of space where it's hostile, it's kind of informal, but it's formal as well. Who gets recognized in that space? and what can be done differently as well. All right, so without any further ado then, I'd like to invite um, Annie to, um, to just give us her views about um, feminist approaches to performance management. Is a, feminist performance, is a feminist approach to performance management possible? And what might that look like? And could you share any examples of where you've seen this being done differently? Thank you so much, uh, Shimwewe and everybody. Um, are you able to hear me loud and clear? All right, perfect. Okay, so I like the title, The Elephant in the Room, Salary and Performance. And the title for me is very, very informative, right? Because why do we actually need a feminist approach to performance management, a feminist approach to salary, a feminist approach to benefits, a feminist approach to anything. I think that should be the starting point. If we can answer the question why, we will be able to get to the answers of what we need to do differently. So for me, when I was thinking about this question, I thought about my own career, which has spanned over two decades and has had very interesting moments of the elephant in the room. So I'll just give one short story uh, as I try to talk about the why question, why it's so important to actually have a feminist approach to salary and performance management. It so happened 10 years ago, the time came where I finally had to be productive in terms of reproduction. Uh, I had my first child and I was fortunate enough to be in an organization that gave a significant amount of uh, maternity leave. It was six months. Um, the interesting thing about that was in those six months, whilst I was happy to be with my child, it also meant I was 
in a mainstream organization where I was not able to represent myself as well as represent the team I was leading uh, during that period. Uh, I was heading a unit at that time. So I had the opportunity to influence, I had the opportunity to uh, advocate for myself. The reason why I'm giving these sort of like uh, descriptors is for you to understand that even at a senior level, the, um, the fight for equity, the fight for fairness, the fight for inclusivity does not matter in terms of the level where you sit. Uh, of course, it becomes much more difficult for those who are much more junior in any organization. So off I went to maternity leave for my six months. And in those six months, a couple of things happened. One is one of my male colleagues who was also heading his own unit decided his unit was not good enough just by itself. He didn't want one. He's like, you know what? Went to our boss and said, I think if we combine my unit and any's unit into one, we actually may perform better and, you know, we'll find a role for her. Maybe she can move from being a head to a technical advisor and I can head the whole unit. Fortunately, I had someone sitting in an acting position who broke protocol during my maternity and told me what was happening. And then I talked to those who have power within the organization to say there's a whole transition that's happening with my, without my knowledge. When I came back uh, from maternity leave, the system had moved things around. We had to apply for new positions. And what then happened was very, very interesting. The position I got had been advertised as a head role. However, in the grading system, it was not compensated as a head role. It was compensated as a senior technical advisor or something like that. So the reason why I'm sharing this, I'll come back to all the dimensions of the story, is when I then used my voice and said, you know, but I am being compensated. I'm also a head like everyone else. However, my grading is not right. Uh, ducking and diving. Yes, we'll get back to you, HR. Uh, my my um, boss at that time, a director, uh, then said to me, you know, we've just had a transition. We don't want to rock the boat, but don't worry. I'll take care of it for you. Right. So long story short, for three years, I worked the same workload, if not more than everybody else. I can say so for myself and those who know me in that organization know that I really did a heavy lift. I tried to get back to HR. They were like, you know, that ship has sailed. We can't open, you know, it was a whole restructure process. We can't do that for one person who set precedence. So why don't you just wait a little bit? You know, we're going to do another uh, change in about a year or two, you know, we will then compensate you. My boss did not want to hear about it. It's like, you know, we don't rock the boat, you know, just. And I listened. I did not advocate for myself. I did not make noise. I did not whistle blow. I did not say. So the reason why I'm sharing this story uh, is a couple of reasons. The reason why we need a feminist approach to salary and performance management, let me start, start with salary before I go to performance, is because we need to recognize the reasons why, particularly women and other people of other uh, discriminations or uh, of other uh, disadvantages need to be supported to have a voice, right? So, Part of the, when I reflect back, I was asking myself, why didn't I make more noise? So socialized to listen to authority, socialized to follow protocol, socialized to wait my turn. So if we do not support those who feel that they are being disadvantaged within the system, it means a lot of abuses, discriminations, missed opportunities are not taken care of. So when we talk about a feminist approach to, in this case, salary and benefits and compensation, the system should already 
include fairness, inclus inclusivity, space for redress when there are any challenges. And you do not have to depend either on a head of HR or on a particular line manager. So that is one point, that the reason why it's absolutely necessary for us to be thinking about doing salary and uh, performance management differently is because sometimes we are there in the organization. We know we are being discriminated. We know we are being paid or compensated unfairly from our colleagues, usually male colleagues, usually certain people of color right? But we don't speak up. We don't rock the boat. So we need to then address those things that limit us or stop us from speaking out and rocking the boat within the organizational system. I know there's personal work that needs to be done, which is personal work I did after that, right? And right now, there is no way something like that is going to happen to me again. And the other reason is this was an individual battle. When we talk about feminist approaches, to anything we are talking about, collective action and collective action and change for greater good. I could have in that moment tried to find out if there was anyone else who has had a similar situation, but I just looked at my own struggle. Maybe the system had disadvantaged other people who had other intersex, intersecting discriminations, right? So th th there is a need to be thinking and using a feminist lens of collective good, collective fairness, co that the system or the compensation structure should be considering everybody. Then the other point I wanted to make is the reason why we need a feminist approach uh, to salary and benefits, I'll come to performance, salary and benefits and compensation is because particularly those who have to take reproductive breaks, right? They, they step out of the market and the, and the system and the organizational system. And when they step out, what I have seen happens is we've given you maternity leave, the organization goes ahead and everything is moving ahead. But you are, yes, benefiting from maternity leave, but you are losing out with no one taking care of your interests normally during that whole period, you're not in the system. So if someone is not in the system and they cannot be at the table and represent themselves, should they now suffer for not being at the table? So the reason why we talk about feminist, uh, um, the importance of feminist uh, principles such as you know fairness, such as equity, such as inclusion, such as, such as representation of all groups and all people is because you can't always be at the table. You can't always be the one who's negotiating for the package, who's negotiating for the sliding scale in terms of uh, benefits, who's negotiating for the step increase. So it means whoever is given that responsibility should be guided by a set of principles that represents everybody. So just as a conversation of I think I will start there and come back again with more stories, uh, maybe one now that's looking at, at performance. But I just thought if we go to the why question, right, of, of why we're even having this conversation, we'll be able to get more answers. Thank you, Chimwe. Thank you so much, Annie, for sharing um, your personal experience and story. I think that is very important. Um, we cannot thank you enough for allowing yourself to, to, be, to be courageous enough to share that with us. And um, I cannot imagine what, um, what that whole experience, um, how it affected you. Uh, we know you've grown out of it or you have healed from it, but, or you're healing from it. But um, I think all, a lot of people in this, in this room would share similar stories. And so on that note, before I invite Jackie, I just want to, to invite us to, to give ourselves grace. And if anything is discussed in this room that you find triggering, feel free to step out and step back in if you need to, um, because we realize this can, you know, this can be quite um, sensitive. So Jackie, building on um, onto what Amy has just shared, um, would like to hear from you 
whether and what are some of the feminist and intersectional ways of determining and managing compensation, uh, whether compensation should be linked to an individual's performance, financial need, position, um, and other identity markers that, um, identity markers, gender, um, gender markers that any has just spoken to um, as well. And please feel free to share examples from your from CV source and you know other spaces that you that you that you're engaged in or have been engaged in. Okay, thank you. I can, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Probably before you get into it, is this yes. where we share the slide? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. So I think you get get started, and the slide will come up as you speak. So good afternoon, good morning, good evening from wherever you're calling from. The thought that struck me even as Annie was speaking was, and an invitation I, I, I make to all of us as we leave this call, I think each of us has a story about salary. And I think it would be interesting when we, we get off this call to actually go back and and, and write that story. You know, what is your memory of the first salary you received? What has been the story of your salary as you progress through your work? And pick apart, um, you know, your feelings, your thoughts, your frustrations, your angst, your joys. And I, I think if we do write those stories, we would, you know, interesting things would emerge, interesting patterns would emerge about how we negotiate this very, very vulnerable issue. And when I call it vulnerable, I don't know what it's like in your part of the world or where you work. Salary is very secretive, right? You sort of, first of all, you negotiate it with your employer alone in a room. Uh, after that interview, they say, so how much do you want to? And you sit in that space of, should I truly be truthful? Will you actually hear my truth about what I think I am worth? Or, and if you want the job, so you fear to, to speak about what you think you're worth, uh, because you fear you might lose the job, you fear you might, you know, might, they, might, they might think the wrong thing about you. And, and it's, so it is a very, it's a very, it's an interesting space of vulnerability. I think the other vulnerable point is, um, like I said, it's not talked about. I don't know how many of us know in the whole organization what everybody earns. You, you sort of guess by hierarchy, these people above me earn more than I, but do we actually you know, know the, the, the figures? And then for leaders like me, the other vulnerability is it keeps us awake at night because every, I, I work in a, you know, quasi business nonprofit space. So that intersection where you, the business is not yet making enough to pay everybody. And yet, and so you, you, you still have to raise grants, but knowing that that combined total of income does not even cover um, your, resource, your human resource needs. And so, you know, you keep awake at night. There's a time I actually suffered insomnia, near depression, because you keep, you know that so many lives depend on you. Everybody's looking at you to figure out that salary thing. And your negotiation with donors, like in a very vulnerable space, because you're, you're negotiating with power, you're negotiating with people who predetermine what they think you should earn, especially if you're a woman in a black body from the global South. So there are so many layers um, and 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 he talked about it of um injustice of inequality of unfairness of yeah inequity um that that we sit in even as we talk about this elephant in the room and we can go to the next slide so as I was thinking about this I I thought to myself can we go to the next slide Chime or whoever is um managing the slides. Yeah, I actually like elephants. <laughs> I think I call elephants my spirit animal. 
And uh, so it was interesting, yes, that we're talking about the elephant. Sometimes it, when we say the elephant in the room, sometimes it's said in a negative way, but um, the elephant is my spirit animal. I actually recently got a tattoo of an elephant. I don't know if you can see it. I tried to take a picture of it, but it's in a funny place on my body, so I, I couldn't angle the camera well. Um, today I'm wearing rings that have elephants, so really, truly, I'm, a, I'm an elephant at heart. But the beauty about elephants is I think they force us to see and acknowledge that which we wish we could hide from. And I think the area of performance manager and salary are things we wish we could hide from, and yet they are always ever present from the time you say you want a job all the way to the end of your life work, wherever that may be. So it is a thing we must all contend with. And I'll go to the next slide, please. So where we begin as Civ Source, and again, it's, it's part of even my fear coming into this conversation was, ah, we don't have it all figured out. We're still fumbling in the dark, it seems sometimes. And so we start from, Oh, sorry. I sorry. You know that the, the comments pop up, so I was distracted a bit. So, at this source, we start from a point of seeing, because I think that's what salary should, or is that's what salary is about. Uh, it is the point at which you are seen in the workspace. When we had just started CIFSOS, maybe two years into our journey, we studied a book together called "Strategies for Building an Organization with a Soul." And it was co-written by Hope Chigudu, who I believe was a guest at the last um, space, and her niece, Rudo Chigudu. And they start in at the point of seeing. Um, and oh, I spelled that wrong. I need to, to change it because it's a South African greeting, Samona, meaning I see you. I see you in the totality of who you are, not just your physical self, but your spirit self, your your routine, your, because when I come to the space as a person working, I come with all of who I am. Therefore, do you see me? Um, do we acknowledge that the people, that, that we work with people? We're not working with products, with inputs. We are working with people. And so what is the way in which we see or how is salary an expression of seeing people? to the extent that we can, of course, but how is salary a space, a place of seeing? How do, we, how do we remove and take away the lens through which we see people when we think about salary and compensation? Just asking questions, just as I ask myself, and I feel like you know, I'm, I'm going to be raising more questions and answers, truly. And we can go to the next slide. So as we at CivSource were contemplating our wellness and what that looks and, and feels like, we developed a, a wellness charter. And one of our first sentences in describing our wellness is, we see each other, we are present to each other. And we express that in different ways. But the first point, I think, the first point of entry, do you see this person as a person? Or do you see them as an end, a means to an end for your organization, for your work cycle, for your work project? Do we see each other? Or what are feminist ways of seeing the people that we work with? The next slide. I think the, the other challenge with, with salary or the other question that is very evident in salary is value. Because in a sense, salary is placing a value judgment this is what I think you are worth. And who determines that value? And what is the, the center point of that value? Because I know my value, or I think I do, and maybe not always actually. My employer thinks they know my value and so predetermines a person at this level will earn X. And sometimes, like I said, those of us who work in a space where we don't always have the opportunity even to predetermine our value, where it's valued from you know, geographies that are far removed from our reality, your value is predetermined by your skin, by, your, by many things, right? So it is a question, what do you bring to our collective table? In Simpsons, the way we've tried to manage this is to see each other beyond our job titles. 
And if you go to our uh, website and our team page, you will not see our job titles. You will see the value we hope we bring to the table when we come to work together. And if you look at those roles, values that we say we bring to the civil source table, how do you even compensate them? The, the, the one I always like to talk about is heart. Sandra, who is our wellness happiness manager, sees herself as the heart of Civil Source Africa. How do you value a heart? How do you pay a heart in your organization? Because you know, when the heart stops pumping, it dies, right? And yet in the hierarchy, you know, in, in you, she probably earns least, which for me is sad. And so again, like I said, it was good that we're having this conversation because it made me think about, is that how we want to express value? How else can we express value? Is salary the only way to express value? It is part of the way, but is it the only way? And how do how do people grapple with this? And it would be lovely to hear from, from each of us. Um, next slide. And I'm trying not to take a lot of time. Sorry, I'm watching it. Um, so when I when I think of salary, I think of three concentric circles. There's value, there's security, and there's appreciation. And given our third world economies, given um, the volatile political environment, given shrinking space, can salary truly provide security? I'm not even sure. A lot of us often say we are one salary away from vulnerability, from shocks. That's how sad it is. That's how painful it is. And so sitting in this space of vulnerability, does salary truly provide stability and security or it's an illusion and so how do we deal with it as organizations how we how do we deal with it as people and going back to my invitation in the beginning if you were to write your salary story and all the things that are attached to it where does stability and security sit for you or for your organizations as organizations when we know we truly cannot even provide we, we hope we can but we know we can't provide stability and security what does that look like? What does that feel like? Where do we take these pains and this worry? Um, the next one, please. So I said, for me, when I think of salary, it's three concentric circles of value, security, and appreciation. I hope that when, my, that when we dispense salary every month, it is a way to tell my staff, I truly appreciate you. I know it is not enough. I know it is never going to be enough, but this is hopefully one way to say, I see you, I value you, I appreciate you. At the same time, for me, the thing that I struggle with is that what I'm able to provide feels like a patchwork of tattered clothes because it's never enough because I get a little from this project, from that project, from that project, and when you try and pull it all together, sometimes it doesn't even come together. This is what you're, is this how we want to appreciate? And for me, it's a, it's a place of pain. It is a place of pain. What does one do? And how do we truly show appreciation? What are the other ways? Um, how do you show appreciation to your staff beyond salary in your organization? I think there's one more slide and I, it talks about the boxes that we live in. And these are the boxes that I contend with when I think of salary. There's an aid system. And, and those of us in the nonprofit space know this aid system. Um, overheads is almost said like a dirty word, like no one wants to fund overheads. People want to fund work, but don't want to fund the humans that do that work. And so when you're in an, a mostly when you get your salary from a system that does not appreciate the devalues that is extractive of the human element in the work, how do you determine salary? There's a global financial system. Our, our, many of us live in contexts where our, our, um, our money is devalued almost on a daily basis, almost on a daily basis. It's weakened against global um you know global systems of money so when you live in such a box what does salary look like and especially when you can't increase it year to year to year so Simsos has existed six years i've hardly been able to raise salary 
from when we started six years ago. And for me, that means that a salary I paid six years ago is no longer enough because the ceiling is devaluing. And that is a place of pain when you know you can't pay enough. There's a global system, North South, like I said, where the assumption is people, if you're Southern, you should earn less because we are seen as less than, not deserving, not quite matching up, we lack capacity, that is the story. So again, if you're providing salary in a system that sees you as less than, then you're challenged. A gender system, and we talked about it, right? Um, men, women, and I know feminists around the world have often championed equal pay for equal work of equal value. But what does that even mean and look like? Is it truly work of equal value? And how, how, who even determines this value system? Labor system, finally, right? Where again, oftentimes our care work, our extra work as women is not seen, is not valued, is not appreciated, it's, it's invisibilized. And no one wants to pay that work that we do above the work, right? That work that falls in between the cracks. Yesterday I was working with a leader and he said that if you put all these things together, Global South, I'm speaking from the Global South, um, it's almost like not only must you be poor, you must look poor because you cannot ask for what you're worth because the system within which you work doesn't see you as worthy. So for me, in a, in a nutshell, that is, that is those are the things that I, I with as a leader of an organization, knowing that I cannot provide enough knowing that I, I'm looking for, you know, what, what can we do? What can I do? And what is a feminist way to do it? One thing I wish that I could tell our donors, I wish, this is my wish, if we could pull all the monies from HR and then I divide, I mean, from human resource, from salary, and then divide it 23 ways, we are 23 staff, and each of us take the same. That's what I wish. Because I truly believe we all bring value to the table and there's no way for me to say one is more valuable than the other that's where i'll end for now thank you so much for listening thank you jackie for bringing so many things to the table that we that we need to grapple with as we think about um, salary and performance management um i would like to ask you to give us in two minutes how you manage the rotational ceo because I think that's important. So if you could do that in a minute and in the second minute, tell us how then you do the performance management aspect of it or how it's linked to your, to your compensation package. I think there's a lot of interest in the room to, to learn from there. And, and, so, and for those who um, follow me on LinkedIn or, or Instagram, I, I sort of explained what our rotational CEO model is. Uh, so I founded CISO six years ago, but always, always knowing that one day I will leave and wanting um, to prepare both myself and my organization for that moment when I would leave. And so about three, four years ago, uh, one of the staff members actually said, you know, uh, it was during COVID um, when there was lockdowns and no, nobody was going anywhere. And one of these staff members said, you know, uh, when Jackie used to travel, <laughs> we used to experience other leaders, but now she's, you know, and I think it was, no, no, I think it was said in good faith. And so I sat back and thought, you know what? Yeah, we can have another leader, even when I'm around. It doesn't always only have to be when I'm away and you put an acting CEO. And so we thought of an initiated rotational leadership. By that we mean, whether I'm in the country at office or not, one of the staff members acts as CEO for four months. I don't have time to explain all of it. So that's what I'm saying, please go to the article I wrote recently on, on LinkedIn. And during that time, they are given full powers, except the bank mandate, because that we can't keep changing, um, but full powers to decide to lead the team, for them to experience and grow their own leadership and for the team to experience um, another person leading. So that's what we're doing to strengthen our muscle to be ready to change when the time comes comes for me to go. For now, we've started with four months. As we go on, we will lengthen it. Um, as we go on, we keep tweaking it. Next year, I'm thinking because the first two leaders and the one who you know sat down for it, spoke with them, 
Next year, I'm thinking maybe the team should choose from amongst themselves. Why does it have to be me to choose who the rotational leader will be? So we will keep tweaking it. We'll keep tweaking it. And for now, uh, we compensate them for that extra load that they have. Um, it's not the same, but I think I'm thinking about, you know, doing that the next time and thinking, you know, why not? They should have the power, the pleasure, the perks, the pains. <laughs> but yes, it's to experience truly leadership in all its um, length and breadth. And I don't remember the second question you asked right. me. No, that, uh, that, that covers it really. So at the time that they are leading, they assess yeah. my performance. Because even oh. in rotation leadership, I want to model that I can be, that I can follow. I do not always have to be in the in the lead. I can follow. And so they assess my performance. But traditionally, and this is something that I learned from a boss um, a few years ago, where he submitted himself to um, performance measurement by the whole staff. And so I took that practice with me when I lead. I, I pick and choose from the different um, sections in the in the organization for them to give me feedback about how I'm leading. Um, so so that I practice also hearing from as many people in the institution as possible. All right. Thank you so much, Jackie. I think you've just shared so much that we could unpack for quite a while. If there are any takeaways that I, I would want us to be thinking about is when we think about feminism or feminist leadership, we're thinking about co-shared co-leadership or shared power, shared leadership. And I think what Jackie has shared is a very good example of that. When we think about human resource management and um, you know some of the best practices that are discussed there, there's aspects of job rotation of how you can compensate people differently besides you know the actual salary. And I think offering someone an opportunity to have leadership um, experience, especially at the peak of the organization, is one way of thinking about that. And I believe this can also be practiced at department level for those that are working. Um, you know, for, for example, in bigger structures. And also a lot of learnings that can actually be adopted into the corporate world for any of us that are, that are you know, are joined, that are not necessarily in the nonprofit sector, but we're in the, in the corporate world. So without any further, and then I just want to also highlight that we're taking note of all the reflections that are coming through the messages. And Caroline, thank you for sharing um, your experiences. I think that some of those are conversations that we might be able to tackle here, but I will encourage you to network in this room and see whether you can have further conversations with some of the people in this room. I think they would have great insight um, to offer to you um, as well. So Maxencia, um, this is your time now. I'd like to hear from you about intersectionality. You know, what are the, what are the, what is an intersectional approach to performance management and compensation? What would that ideally look like? And I'd like to invite you to not only speak about, to not necessarily just speak about the experiences you've had, but rather your aspirations. What do you hope are the things that we start doing in terms of performance management and compensation? And there we're talking about disability justice approach. What does that look like? Where is everyone failing? And how can it support us to challenge notions of efficiency, of productivity, and the question of value, which um, which both Annie and um, and Jackie have pointed to, Maxencia? Thank you so much, uh, Chimomo. Uh, this is an interesting session, and I'm happy to be the last because. Um, taking on so many issues that have been raised by the previous speakers. Um, when I got uh, this, I read it several times for some time, and today as an employer, I could just see what happened in the spaces that have been too, including my own organizations. And I was like putting it on a, a weighing machine to see if really what I'm going to talk about today really apply in my own organization. Now, reflecting more about this topic, the intersectionality between an employer and employee, I just imagined this woman on a wheelchair rolling into this office looking for a job. I imagine this trans woman entering this room for an interview with that 
big voice. I just imagine this gray haired man who had applied for this job where people would expect young people to come for it. And here comes a gray haired woman, haired woman who comes for this interview. And believe me, you, the performance of that person who entered that room has already been determined. And people will say, now this gray haired woman, really? Now, this person looks at this uh, trans woman or whatever and then says, huh? Will she do it? Is she a he or her? You know, they are already weighing you, even the performance before you do the work. And when you get into this wheelchair, into this space, and everybody's like, how will she manage anyway? Now, when we talk about the feminist theory, where we talk about the inequalities, in the inequities in terms of uh, work, because any work that is done by anybody can be done by anybody because without gender, race or anything, as long as this person has the expertise, has the qualification and is able to do it. And it is about the production. So that biasness that this employer has at the time you enter this room already determines whether this employer will be comfortable or later on you will prove him or her or disprove him or her at the end of the day when the work is done. So these are things that came into my mind, into the social networks, into the economic spaces, into the political spaces. Where is the equal pay? I also remember that time when I had tested positive and I had lost my husband and I was applying for this job uh, in the 2000 when there was a lot of institutional stigma. It wasn't about the CV you are presenting. It wasn't about the experience we are bringing, but now, the moment they know about your status, everybody will say, oh, will she do this work? Now, bringing my own perspective, when I stood for political offices in 2011, when I'm participating as a member of parliament, they could not even think about anything about me, the dignity affirmation, the unconditional uh, whatever situations. They could just say that she's HIV positive. People would come and listen to my uh, to my rallies and they listen and the message is powerful and they would say, she has a message. But they told us before we count the votes, she'll be dead. Any condition of positive regard, you know, like people just look at the disability in you. People just look at uh, the kind of person you, uh, you uh, that is presenting in front of them and they decide. Until we interrogate those issues that Jackie and uh, Elena has just have talked about, we cannot know the performance of this person. Now, drawing it back to our offices, I know majority of us on this call are employers or employees. Now, how do we ascertain? How do we put these approaches? How how do we put these structures? When we are doing our organograms, how do we put this organogram? Is there a person with a different ability on this structure of this organization? Or we say, she will disturb us when we have those late meetings. So how do we look at it? Like when we wanted to do employ someone as an accountant and there comes a woman in a wheelchair and she presents these papers and we're like, but now, She'll take a lot of time when we need her as soon as possible, she'll not make it. This is an attitude all of us might be having in our respective organizations, but we just look by look of the face, by looking at someone and say, she may not do it, but not interrogating the kind of power this person has and the environment within we are working. How are those systems, when we decide to remunerate our staff, when we try to remunerate or compensate our staff, how do we do it? Is it transparent? Or we go behind the table and say, Cynthia, I don't think she deserves this. I think she works less hours because of her disability. But what is the roles and responsibilities that you assign to this person as long as she can perform? So how are those systems within our uh, respective organizations where we belong. And now, what is the feedback? What is the feedback? When someone is performing and you think this person is not performing well, how do we tell this person? I knew, I knew by employing you, I knew you could not perform. Even when 
someone is performing regularly well and you say, mm, you have tried. But we try to encourage people and say, please pull it, pull up, pull up your socks, you'll do it. You are soon making it, even when someone is not performing to that level. But even the buyer says, Sometimes we are biased as employers and we may not want to promote this person and say, if I give her this kind of a remark, she'll just be proud of who she is. And we sometimes don't want to promote, especially us as women, to promote fellow women. So what feedback are we promoting? What are we giving back? How do we communicate back to our employers? And employees, sorry. And what are the mechanisms within organizations? I looked at my organization, which is 18 years now. They were like, yes, those days when we were not stricken with this donor funding, which is so meager today, we used to do a lot of capacity building for staff. We used to do a lot of empowerment for staff. How often do we empower them? How do we improve the performance? Or we do the appraisals because we want to eliminate some of them, and then we bring this staff appraisals just to eliminate these people from these spaces. So how do we do this? It is about the approaches that we use to determine the compensation. And this is what brings us to the uh, different approaches. If it is a, a performance-based approach, there is no need about looking about Maxentia as a disabled woman, as a woman who is living with HIV to perform this task. No, it is about what work she's producing. If there is equal pay for equal work that we are doing in this organization, then it should be to everybody who we employ in our organizations, irrespective of who they are. But oftentimes we underlook this. And financial need best compensation, our approach. What is it? If this lady has a disability and you think giving her a car to is her coming to the organization, please do that. But how often do we do that? We only wait until she comes late and we say, after all, there are so many out there who can do this work and faster and on time. So let us just eliminate her. But the best way would be, what measures are we putting in place to make sure that everybody this organization can perform within a conducive environment that is for and the transparency and accountability. I talked about it. When you want to increase salaries for your workers, now, how do you do it? Is it transparent? Or we just sit there, a few people of us and say, myself as a director and my accountant, let us determine this. We shall give this one this, we shall give this one that. We have won this grant. Okay, we had budgeted for this. Let us give our money e one million to someone else. Did you explain to this person? Did you talk to this person when I'm doing this? But you used your power and for a hierarchy to determine it without being transparent to the staff that you are employing. Now, when you look at the position best, let people be paid as they had applied as they were the roles and responsibilities describe, describe what they are supposed to do. If it is an executive director with those transparent systems and we know the executive director is receiving this amount because this is what is put in her contract or in her roles and responsibilities. Then if it is about hybrid compensation, now, look at the women who sweep the roads of Kampala. I have heard stories of these women who are sweeping roads in Kampala. They get up very early in the morning, as early as four, to go and sweep the streets. There is no security whatsoever. There is nothing. They are raped. They are abused. But they have stayed for about three years without being paid. This is a kind of uh, hybrid compensation or remuneration to these people. They should be considered to be paid first because there is complexity in the work that they are doing. They're not paid. Look at the security guards who are putting their lives at risk. They are not paid. So these approaches oftentimes in our organizations are not followed. They are not used. They are not there. 
We don't know even what to do. Sometimes we employ people to just manipulate them, to make sure they do work for us, but without appreciation, without even thinking about compensating them for the work that they do. Now, when it comes to disability, what should a disability just approach be? It is about accessibility. It is about reasonable accommodation. It is about that unconditional positive regard I talked about and dignity affirmation. So when I go for this interview and the interviewer has to say, let us first interview this lady who is lame. Then the rest we shall do your interviews later. Let's handle this lame woman. Please come forth. Please try to be strong. Please try to be, and then the, all these kind of intimidating words. It doesn't matter whether I am lame, I attempt to apply for this job. In the first place, I'm a human being. And I'm applying for this job where anybody, if anybody else will apply. So just address me because you have my application. And then you have to say, okay, Maxencia, come forth for this. Oftentimes, we just want to describe these people by who they are. What are those transgender ladies? Put them first. Even if we go to hospitals, even if we go to health centers, that is a order for HIV positive persons. They go there. Okay, the key populations have their own desk in the corner. So you are explaining this person as per who she is in terms of presentation, but not the ability within this person. So accessibility to the places of work. Is there a reasonable accommodation for them? I give an example. And previously, uh, the last two, three months, we had interns from Makerere University. We normally get them during that period of time. And uh, the person who is... Uh, doing the internship at uh, the programs officer at our organization, realized there was a, a young lady who had uh, a hearing impairment, impediment. And he whispered to me and said, when I'm talking to them, when I'm giving instructions to them, she doesn't pick it up very fast. And I have to repeat again. When I put her aside, I talked to her. She explained to me that she has an issue. How often do employers know the different impediments employees have? You see someone coming late for work and you don't know and you don't bother even to find out why would this person be coming late? And now someone would say, ah, but for you, I give an example when I lost my husband as a young woman. And then my boss was ever telling me, come to the office, come to the office. When I lost my husband, he gave me only one week to stay home to mourn. And when I went back to work, he said, uh-huh, whatever has been holding you back is now done. I don't want to see you anymore late here. At a time you come late here, You'll find your dismissal letter at the gate. This was not comforting for someone who has lost a husband at a tender age, a young age. Instead of at least encouraging me to work to take care of my young children, this was the message from my boss. So accessibility, reasonable accommodation, accommodating these people as they are. Today we are fighting a situation in Uganda TQ women are suffering even to present themselves for work because of who they are. And that puts it, uh, they put a, a, a Uganda at a stake because there is going to be brain drain because these are women who are learned That's and true. have experience and can do the work. So improves inclusion. How many of us in our organizations have different categories of people working with us and flexibility. So I want to conclude here by uh, giving you an example of uh, James Nicholas, Lisa Evangelist and motivational speaker. I'm sure everybody would wish to employ him if we got hold of him. He has no arms, he has no legs, but what he does, many people who are able cannot do. Thank you for now. Thank you, Maxencia, for sharing so much um, with regard to your personal experiences, um, your attempt to do diff things differently at your organization, um, how your experiences at a tender age informed um, 
you know, what you decided to do in order to make a difference. And also the experiences of, um, if you like, informal workers and former workers in Uganda, which we sometimes tend to forget, right? When we're talking about performance management and salary compensation, we're usually thinking of very structured um, spaces. And I see some of the questions coming in about, so um, what are some of the feminist ways of measuring performance before we even get to deciding on salaries? And we need to realize this is a, a lot of this is informed by um, by how this should be done. And I do like, like I do like Laila that you said set up a second question with kind of nuances the thinking that comes with this. So it's important that we're thinking about how performance uh, management or um, compensation can be repli can be how the thinking around this is replicated in other areas. So the issue about, for example, grant management has a lot to do with performance management and salary and 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 compensation, right? When we think about who we award grants, when we think about grant making organizations, and for those that are grant managers in this space, directly or indirectly, a lot of what we do our decision making is based on this, which means the biases or the inclinations, the problematic inclinations, the capitalist inclinations, the neoliberal inclinations that are built into how we understand performance management and issues of compensation, who should be awarded and who should be awarded, what does productivity look like, what should we value, actually comes out in, in all of this. I'm also now thinking about organization development, development cap, organizational capacity development, that actually a lot of it is borrowed from all of this. So thank you, our dear panelists, for such uh, comprehensive um, submissions. And now I see there are a lot of questions in the chat, but what I will do is to allow people to speak, I'll turn over some of these questions to us. Um, and so please feel free to either write in the chat or to put up your hand to make a contribution. Feel free to nuance the conversation further share your experiences where you're doing feminist, uh, where you're attempting to do things differently, um, and or, or answer these three questions. One of these three questions, which I'll post in the chat as well. What are some of the feminist ways of measuring performance before we even get to deciding on salaries and appraisals? And I've borrowed this question from Somia. So I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, and then another question is, what are some of the feminist ways of measuring performance? Sorry, this is a repetition. Um, the second question is, how do we free ourselves from a capitalist and colonial traditional ways of performing and of assessing performance? Um, and then finally, what does a disability justice, no, that's not the question I wanted to ask. And finally, let's see, where is the other question? Let's start with those two, and I'll share the third question in the chat. Um, and so, as I've said, feel free to put up your hand and I'll let you have the floor where you nuance or answer any of these questions or offer ideas um, about how we can do these things differently. Thank you, Leila. Right, anybody that wants to share their thoughts? I do know we have burning questions, so you can also ask questions, but there, you know, in as much as you ask questions, would will we invite part of the audience to respond to questions? So if a question is raised by one participant, another participant can respond to it so that we, we hear from different um, persons besides our panelists. Our panelists will make closing remarks, but I thought it would be good to hear from us as well. Wambui, do you have anything you want to share, Caroline? I see a hand raised, um, Leila. Yes, I see it too, thank you. Uh, Leila, you have the floor. Hi everyone, thank you so much for this. Uh, what a fantastic space to think together. Um, I wanted to quickly share an experience on the question that I've posted about freeing our minds from a from um, colonial performance and from capitalist and masculine performance. I moved from a um, from the corporate world into feminist organizations and I brought with me unfortunately, um, well, in a capitalist world, it's very clear. 
you need to work faster, work better, make more money, and that's performance, and that's what gets um, appreciated. And this comes with deeply masculine culture and deeply, now I wouldn't only call it masculine, anti-feminist and capitalist and deeply colonial culture. Unfortunately, in the feminist spaces, and I feel privileged for working in a radical feminist organization where we consciously want to do better, but we haven't had the span of time and the span of resources to develop tools to do better. So we are learning as we go. Um, and as we try to change our understanding of performance, I would say that our understanding of hierarchy and leadership is centered to that. Um, and an example of this is unless we unless we reconsider how we are looking at leadership and what's the role of leadership in terms of culture, it's very unlikely that we shift these tools about performance. How do we still see how are we serving our feminist values and feminist goals without needing and pushing others to be faster, produce more, be more active. This has a disproportionate impact on women of color because we already come from spaces where we need to work 10 times as hard just to get half the appreciation. And, and if we continue to, be, to, to push this cycle, we are going to end up with even more burned out, exhausted women of color and women in general, and who are gonna who are gonna feed into this cycle. So I'd I'd say first we need to redefine leadership, and I'm really grateful that you're looking at this within the bigger conversation about leadership and feminist values. What is good? leadership? Is it expanding organizations, making them bigger or richer? Or is it settling in in our values where everybody who's involved feels that this is worth of their effort and of their energy and of their time away from their family? And how do we assess that? The second point is, what does a dignified feminist employment experience look like? And um, what are we bringing our, with us from the capitalist tools and how can we consciously identify them and stop them? How can we create spaces for everybody to contribute to that? One of the things that are, have been central and I'm incredibly proud of in the organization I work in is that we link hierarchies or the need to dismantle them with applying feminist values. Unless um, an example is for example, in terms of pay, unless the lowest paid person gets paid very, very close, comparably to the highest paced person, then we are pushing um, pushing the values that we claim to want to oppose in the world. Um, so we have the one of the lowest tensions in the industry I'd like in the in the sector I'd, uh, I'd like to believe while we still see organizations that throw feminist values at us and the highest paid person gets paid 50 times more than the lowest paid person although both of them work really hard and both of them spend time away from their families and and all the reasons that some get paid more than the other are structural to a, a capitalist colonial world. How do we keep this in, in our mind? And lastly, in terms of performance, one thing that has been incredibly helpful to me individually is to appreciate that performance and the value and the depth and the, 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 uh, of knowledge and experience um, needs to be um, uh, needs to be separated from. Uh, from what we look at as the employment ladder. There's people who don't want to manage people. They don't want to um, uh, uh, grow their team or grow their budgets or grow their titles. How can we show them appreciation and show them that they are developing and to keep the work interesting and meaningful uh, and with integrity without these very traditional ways of, you know, you go up in the ladder, you go up in the pay, you go up in the uh, respect or meaningful or so on. So this is really important to introduce uh, to the spaces we're in. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Leila. That, that was a lot and it would be great to hear from you. Um, I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly so that I'm not confusing you with Leila. So Leila is just reminding me that we've got five minutes to go. Um, I'll try to do this within the next seven minutes. Um, Javika, you had your hand up. I think it would be good to hear from you. I hope I've pronounced your name correctly. Yes. Did you have anything you still want to share? And yeah. after that, we'll move on into a Mentimeter where we're just going to um, put together our takeaways 
um, in a visual manner and you know what we think we could be doing differently. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, just a quick question on the structural aspect of salaries and uh, funding. I think both of them are linked together, which is, you know, there's a emphasis on wall, um, supporting feminist movements, but so much of it is voluntary. It's seen as partnerships. It's seen as collaborations. But in the names of collaborations and partnerships, we see that those who come with lived re realities of oppression are not, especially from the global south, are not paid. And it's seen as, you know, and if, especially in the movement world. And it's so I'm just wondering what you have to say about this whole space of valorizing and sort of, you know, glor glorifying volunteerism. And especially as the young feminist movements from the global south, we've seen this trend increasing. While there's partnerships that increase with young feminists, we still see that it's um, not coming into like looking at resource uh, spacing. So if any of the panelists want to sort of elaborate on that. And the second thing is, how do you look at structural oppressions as part of salary structures? And if there are examples of, um, you know, one is, of course, to say that we acknowledge it ideologically, but in its practice, if there are examples of how you do it, because we've seen um, organizations led by Dalit feminists and others in India or in South Asia, and these are like lower caste feminist spaces, uh, sort of practicing this much more than those who are much more privileged. Uh, so just want to understand it structurally as well. Yeah. All right, thank you, um, Javika. Unfortunately, because of time, I don't, don't know. I do not. The panelists will not be able to respond to all the to the to the two questions. But what I will do is just ask them to give their closing remarks in thirty seconds each. Um, and I would invite you to read on the decent work agenda. I think you're familiar with it. The idea behind that was to actually, you know, move against volunteerism. So I think that's a place to start. Um, in terms of the closing remarks, I'll ask um, the panelists to speak. Well, I'll start with Maxencia, who spoke last, then move on to Jackie and finish up with any. And you do have 30 seconds. What is the main thing you want us to take away or what is your charge? In the background, a Mentimeter link will be shared, um, and I'll ask you to, you know, start populating there so that we can be able to finish um, on time. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, our uh, listeners, whoever has been on this call. Someone asked what we should do. It is just have our projects and systems in place that ensure us equal pay for equal work. I also considering intersectional considerations without thinking about who I am, but what I can do, because what I can do, any other person can do, and putting transparency and accountability systems within our respective organizations. Thank you so much. Jackie, please. Okay, I go away with two questions as a gift from this space, and I'll read them very quickly. Um, what is my mental model for compensation and performance? What value judgments do I place on my staff in a world that glorifies business as a badge of honor? The other question mm -hmm. that I take away from here is, what does a feminist, dignified employment experience look like? That is especially central for me because our first value as civ source is dignity. So I take that away. I take that as a challenge that we shall continue to look at and peel away layers. And like we always say in feminist practice, it starts with me. If I don't change me, I cannot change the way I lead and think. So a lot of a lot of unlearning and learning for me as well. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. And any. Uh, thank you, everybody. Fantastic conversation. Uh, I just want to close uh, with a couple of points around a feminist approach to performance in very practical ways. One is it's about the lenses we use, sort of like the glasses. So if you approach it with a capitalist lens, a mainstream masculine patriarchal lens, then that's what you're going to get. So the values and principles of feminism should be front and center of any uh, performance management system and policies you put in place. Number two, it is about practices. A performance management system is not run by itself, like by a computer. It's run by leaders, it's run by managers. It's something that 
works with the whole organization. So the practices is very important. The culture uh, is something to interrogate. You may have a great system, great values, but the practice in terms of culture, the environment is something to think about. I also want to really emphasize that organizational commitment and political will, we put these things in, in policies and we say we are going to do things differently, like have a performance manage, management system that is open, that is transparent, that is inclusive, that is supportive, that is equipping, that is recognizing and rewarding openly. But the political will to follow through on those nice things is very important. Then the last thing I want to say is recognition of intersectional realities. And there's wealth of knowledge of what those intersectional realities are from a feminist perspective that we've been fighting for decades, if not centuries, and recognition of those realities for every single person. And then making sure that yes, the collective system is collective and transparent and works for everybody, but there's also something that is individualized that recognizes me and my intersectional realities and challenges. So that's what I wanted to close with and say, thank you so much for this space and the opportunity to share some practical tips on this. Thank you so much, Annie, Jackie, and Maxencia. And thank you to you all for staying on the call and you know just being very active in your participation. Please take time to give us our view, give us your views and reflections on the Mentimeter. Um, other than that, thank you so much once again from Fair Share, Akina Mama, and we are feminist leaders. We hope to see you in the next learning series.